Bad news. Bad news for the state. Bad news for capital. Bad news for patriarchy. Bad news for all forms of domination. Bad news. Angry voices from around the world. Our monthly info show from anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio projects worldwide. If these news are bad, I don't want to be good. Welcome to our very first episode of Bad News. This is a new show from our common international network of anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio projects. On the 15th of every month, you'll be able to find on our website a-radio-network.org the latest issue of Bad News. Wait, not so fast. Let's start from the beginning. What is bad news? You know, things are really bad right now. Everywhere. So this will be quite a depressing show. Not necessarily. The more resistance there is, the more there are projects that aim for a future without domination, without coercion, the more we will be having good news, which are bad news for the state. So we need more bad news to have good news. That's right. So what news can we expect? Where do these news come from? The good thing about having an international network is the wide range of topics we will be able to cover. But what news exactly? It's actually the decision of every project participating in the network what they like to share with the world. I noticed this show seems to be in English. What the fuck? That's sad, but true. Let's leave it at that. Come on. At least we could say that there are actually people interested in offering the same show also in other languages, for example, Spanish. We will be seeing a lot of experimentation going on over the months, as each monthly program is actually put together by a different project of the network. So we don't know how the bad news will develop. Maybe they get even worse. Before they get better. In any case, have fun, go out on the streets and make some noise, maybe with our little show. So let's get to our June show. During this episode, you will be hearing about a variety of topics, from new squats and the eviction of old ones, to the resistance against capitalist pipeline projects, anti-colonial resistance, as well as information about the state's attempts at criminalizing women, protesters, and the movement as such, and much, much more. In this show, we will be having segments from Radio Kuruf, from the Valmapu and the Southern Chilean region, the final straw from North Carolina and the so-called United States, Anarchist Radio Berlin, news from Greece from 98FM in Athens and 105FM in Lesbos, Dissident Island Radio in London and last but not least Rosas Negras from El Salvador. Hello comrades, from Radio Groove, Walmapu, Chilean region, to bad news, angry voices around the world. Communities and loves in resistance occupied Canadi's headquarters in Cañete. Canadi is the National Indigenous Development Corporation, which is controlled by the Chilean government. On June 60th, different people from communities and loft in resistance of Arauco occupied Conadi's installation in Cañete as a response for the covert and genocide onset of the Chilean state against the Mapuche nation. It's important to clarify that the Mapuche people are an ethnic community or nation dominated by the state nation of Chile, having a continuous conflict from the colonial time to this era. Jose Winchunao, Lunka of the community said that they were brutally evicted near 5 p.m. of that day, spending the night at the police station. Around 9 a.m. they were set free without charges, but with the certainty of being summoned to an audience. The document released in the moment of the occupation includes various subjects that affected the Mapuche nation, and in that context they declared Bachelet's government had extended her politic of occupation and militarization unprecedented since pseudo-democracy times, torturing their children 
and instilling a politic of terror to all their people. Examples of these are the frustrated homicide of the 17 years old Brandon Hernandez Wentecol in Coyipulli, the torture and kidnapping of the two and three years old children of the Lepiteo Yenquileo family from Guantelolan, the birth of Sayen with her mother tortured and enchanged to the bed of the clinic, the attack against Fabiola Antiqueo in Tumuco, producing the loss of her eye, the attack from behind to Hernán Paredes Puen, who received more than 140 pellets gun shots on his back and legs in Maria Colipi community. The reason of this terror politics is to silence their fair fight, to impose the capitalist interest of pillage and usurpation of their Itrovil Mongen, which is the biodiversity or all life without exception. The forest industry, its monoculture business of pine, will triplicate their production in Arauco, an economic activity that already has more than 7,720 millions on their pockets, and it's known for multiplying the forest fire hazards. Pisciculture of salmon is invading the Región del Biobío, with 72 requests that are supported by the fishing law, even though it's already had devastating consequences on Chiloé. The construction of three new hydroelectric power stations on Elicura Valley will intervene three different rivers, ignoring the indigenous query and the ambiental impact study. In conclusion, the silent negotiations of the IIRSA plan, initiative for the reintegration of the infrastructure in the South American region, between the Latin American states that will deepen the pillage logic of capitalism. Finally, they denounce the militarization of Walmapu, claiming that the state and its institution created new legislation, like the anti-terrorist law, and installed repressions institutions, such as COPS headquarters, with approximately 1,800 COPS near the communities. In this scenario, they demand the end of the violence against their children, the militarization of their territory, and renounce of the governor of Arauco. Besides that, they invited all communities and loved in resistance to join the movement and be present in the Canadian occupation. We stay in the Americas and also on the topic of anti-colonial struggles. A lot farther north we can find strong resistance against projects like the Dakota Access Pipeline. More on that from our friends in North Carolina. This is the Final Straw Radio from the so-called Southeast United States and welcome to Bad News. As anybody who is familiar with North American anarchism is probably aware, the resistance to extractive and mining industries has been on the rise in the past few years, with pipelines being blocked, supply routes sabotaged, and pipeline surveying being fucked with. This is occurring in the wake of some of the highest growth of pro-mining and pro-extraction since the coal mining boom of the 19th and 20th centuries. The coal mines have run dry and they turn their attentions to oil and natural gas in order to feed the military-industrial mechanism, which is their main instrument of power. And even when a pipeline is built, the question is not if it will break, it is when. The industries which perpetrate mining and extraction are bad news for everyone, except of course the very few who make millions of dollars a year on pillaging the land and selling it at a profit right back to those who live there. Pipelines not only ruin all the land and ecosystems they run through, they also disproportionately target poor, indigenous, African American, and other marginalized communities, adding on to the institutional oppression and chronic displacement that these demographics already face. 
The United States government is one which relies on ongoing colonization of indigenous people and an anti-black slavery through the prison industrial complex, not to mention profiteers from extraction being one and the same as the government bigwigs. For example, Donald Trump himself has a cold $2 million invested in Dakota Access, the infamous company behind the Dakota Access pipeline, and the reason for the resistance at Standing Rock, Ocheti Sakawan, and Red Warrior camps. While those camps themselves have ended, their infrastructure having been lit ablaze in order to keep them from falling into police hands, the resistance which began there is far from over. Here are some ways that anarchists and anti-authoritarians are fighting back against these industries. In northeastern Pennsylvania's Lancaster County, opposition to the Atlantic Sunrise natural gas pipeline has taken off. The group Lancaster Against Pipelines has formed there, which is leading the charge against the recently approved $3 billion pipeline. Once built, it will move natural gas southward through 10 Pennsylvania counties. This crew is taking a lot of inspiration from Standing Rock and is defining what it will mean to move forward with anti-pipeline activity by actively coordinating with long-entrenched communities in the area, such as the Amish. This fight is bringing into question the concept of eminent domain, essentially in this case, the seizure of private land by corporations, and the need for the gas since a good amount of it is slated for export. Pennsylvania has long been in a site for anti-extraction activity. It is a poor state which has already been sliced up and partitioned out by mining companies dating back hundreds of years. The anti-fracking grassroots campaign of the 80s and 90s, with opposition to the Marsalis Shale, has laid the groundwork for many more years of resistance to come. Yet another fracked liquid natural gas or LNG pipeline coming from the Marsalis Shale fields of Ohio and West Virginia is the 350-mile-long Mariner East II, being built by Sunoco Logistics. The route would come up through northern Appalachia on its way to Marcus Hook Propane Refinery. In 2016, a tree sit directly in the path of the pipeline was set up on private property resisting eminent domain. The tree sit is called Camp White Pine, and as we write this, they are feeling the first winds of conflict with private security of the pipeline construction. Located in the Susquehanna Valley of so-called Central PA, on occupied Shawnee, Lenape, and Susquehanna territories, and with the permission of the colonial property owners, The camp has been described as the most elaborate tree sit on the east coast of Turtle Island. Moving south to Virginia, people are holding it down and fighting back against surveyors who are trying to pave the route for the Mountain Valley Pipeline, or MVP. At the end of May, locals in the Bent Mountain community blocked surveyor workers and the accompanying private security in defense of their water and soil. The proposed pipeline would carry fracked shale gas through the state of West Virginia into the state of Virginia and likely tie into the wider network of pipelines in the region. The group Protect Our Water, Heritage, and Rights, Power, is calling for a week of action to defund the MVP June 19 to 23rd. Also in the region, people have been organizing in tandem against the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline. The ACP, as it's called, would be a 42-inch, high-pressured, quote-unquote, natural gas pipeline slated to pass through West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina, and run roughly 600 miles or nearly 1,000 kilometers, including through the Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountains, territories of the Monacan people of Virginia, the Tuscarora and Waccama nations of North Carolina, and ending in Lumbee Indian Territory. At this early stage, organizers against the pipeline have been walking the proposed route, talking to residents of communities that would be affected and landowners whose property stands in the pathway in order to strengthen bonds and lines of communication in opposition to the devastating project. Likewise, activists have shut down government presentations on the ACP and filed suits against the corporations Dominion Energy, Southern Company, and Duke Energy, which are behind the ACP. Lawsuits aren't direct action, but they are a tool to slow down and possibly block the projects, so no shit-tucking from us on that end. In a show of solidarity, members of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska have been touring other sites of resistance to pipelines and planting ceremonial corn called Ponca corn as symbolic and spiritual means of uniting the struggles against the desecration of water sources. Also, the Ponca corn is a protected type of corn, making it more difficult for surveyors and destroyers of the land to actually build there. Moving on to Florida, 
Despite the efforts of brave folks who were resisting the drilling and laying of pipe under the Santa Fe and Suwannee rivers in Florida, the Sable Trail pipeline is still being pushed through and constructed. This beast would cross through the states of so-called Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, piping fracked gas over 500 miles and including two compressor stations. The next phase in the resistance is around the bend. But meanwhile, water protectors have upcoming trial dates for locking down to equipment in the path of construction and could use support. Then there's the Algonquin Incremental Market Expansion, blah, or AIM pipeline, run by Spectra and Enbridge, which are planning a three-step upgrade to increase the pipeline infrastructure to carry shale gas through the states of so-called New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts to export terminals in so-called New England and so-called Canada. Frighteningly, the idiots organizing this ecological game of Russian roulette are running the pipeline right past the Indian Point nuclear facility on its 1,100-mile 1, or 1,800-kilometer journey. This project has seen many people locking down to block its construction, leading to activists, some inside the pipeline itself, being arrested at the site, and others at Senator Chuck Schumer's office in late 2016. There are so many more points of resistance that we don't have time to go into it, and the facets we could not explore here include the resumption of the formerly halted Keystone XL pipeline in the Great Plains of Turtle Island, and the continued prosecution and persecution of water protectors struggling against the Dakota Access pipeline, including Brennan Nastasio, Red Fawn Fallis, James White, Katie Crow Cloth, Dean Ortiz, and Brendan Miller Castillo. Stay tuned to Bad News for updates on these and many other situations. This has been us at the Final Straw Radio from the Southeast United States with a presentation on pipeline resistance. Thanks for listening and have a Bad News Day. Sagen Sie jetzt mal bitte Ah, ah, nein, Anarchie. Anarchie. Anarchia. Ob geschichtlich oder brandaktuell? Mit Berichten und Interviews, mit Beiträgen und Collagen beleuchtet das anarchistische Radio Berlin das Phänomen des Anarchismus. Viva Anarchia! You are listening to Bad News, angry voices from around the world. From Anarchist Radio Berlin, we would like to dive in and accompany you on a quick journey visiting new squads that have been popping up all over Germany in the last weeks. We will be visiting occupied spaces in Bochum, West Germany, up in the north in Hamburg, in central Germany in the city of Kassel, and finally in our very own Berlin, located in eastern Germany. Okay, let's start with Bochum. We occupied the house in the Herner Street 131 because we see it as a necessity to intervene and to impede that this house is turned into an object of the speculative market with high-priced renovated apartments. This squad exists since the 19th of May of this year with the idea of creating not only a social space with a cafe but possibly also a living space and a space open to those living on the streets. For now, Herna 131 has organized an open barbecue as a first step towards creating community and building relationships with the neighborhood. But why do the squatters think it's important to occupy? In such cases where the city does not comply with its responsibility to provide for the needs of the populace, we see it as legitimate to make use of direct action to disregard this and to simply break the law. Let's turn to Hamburg. As the state media says, Rund zwei Dutzend Jugendliche aus dem Around two dozen youth from the autonomous left have occupied the Thomas Church in Hamburg, Rahlstedt, during Pentecost weekend. They plan to create a self-managed youth center. Verwaltetes Jugendzentrum schaffen. Indeed, the squatters had organized a spontaneous anarchist summer fest on June 5th at this empty church, thereby effectively occupying it. The church had until the end of 2016 been used as a youth church that had to subsequently be closed due to low attendance from young people. We can easily imagine why. In any case, the squatters had talks with the religious authorities of the Lutheran church and managed to be left in peace, at least until the end of July. Amen. Amen. 
From one holy institution to another, we come now to Unsere Villa in Kassel, a new squad in an occupied villa officially owned by the local university. First occupied in the context of a Reclaim the Streets party, the villa has been squatted since June 3rd. In the beginning, everything seemed fine. We received very good feedback from the neighborhood. People come by and look curiously. Often someone says, it's great that you are using this again. It had been empty for too long. Up until the 9th of June, many different events were successfully organized, including presentations, workshops, concerts and people's kitchen. The idea is that really anyone can come and participate in organizing this villa, as this is no longer the Villa Rühl, but our villa, and it belongs to everyone participating in it. Sadly, things are not so fine anymore. The university has shown its ugly face and denounced the squatters to the police. The future of the squad is uncertain. The final stop of our journey is the social center Friedel 54. As A Radio Berlin, we are specially committed to this project that exists for more than 10 years and lives from the participation of more than 15 initiatives and groups, as well as individuals, but is now in acute danger of eviction by the new owners. The eviction date is June 29th, that is, in two weeks. Wir als anarchistische Gruppe sehen in Projekten wie der Friedel 54 das Potenzial für As users and supporters of the social center, as part of the collective, we demand to sustain this irreplaceable project. As an anarchist group, we see in projects like Friedel 54 the potential for practicing real-life anarchist ideas. Collective efforts demand a high degree of self-organization, networking and activities guided by the principles of self-management and solidarity, as well as social skills. In our social center we can at least to some point experiment and live our concepts and practices of an alternative to capitalism. We make use of the space without any commercial pressure and pass this chance on to those that come to visit our events. We offer vegan food and drinks at a self-chosen price, thereby enabling even people in precarious situations to participate in social life without any discrimination and experience practical solidarity. We want the Die Zeit, die wir haben, auf jeden Fall intensiv nutzen. Wir machen jeden Sonntag eine Kundgebung vor dem Laden. We want to make the most of the time that is left. Every Sunday we organize a rally in front of the center. This is always a good opportunity to spontaneously come by and show solidarity with a low threshold. The program on the next weeks will be very colorful, as is typical of Friedel 54. As long as we have the space, we want to use it. We want to use it to show the neighbors what is happening here, how it is happening, and to continue our struggle against this certification process. That is now affecting us, but that matters to everyone. Prozess der Gentrifizierung, der jetzt zwar uns getroffen hat, aber doch irgendwie alle betrifft, ankämpfen und angehen. Solidarity is needed now more than ever. Especially in the Berlin context, it would be hugely important to break the cycle of successful evictions by the cops. Come to Berlin and participate actively in the efforts to sustain and protect this autonomous, self-managed space. Further south, in the European territory, comrades from Athens in Greece tell us about the new terrorism law and the ongoing evictions of squads. While in the Greek island of Lesbos, the refugee struggle rages on, as people demand for better and safer living conditions, and comrades continue the resistance by organizing anti-fascist events. Give me a K!
Radical News from Athens and the rest of Greece. Prisoners' mobilization in Greek prisons. It has been some weeks now that the prisoners in Greek prisons have started mobilizations demanding better living conditions. As they say, our three main demands relate to the establishment of the provisions of law 4322-2015, the abolition of the prosecution veto on the institution of leaves and the abrogation of the horrendous law concerning the cumulative execution of the sentence when specific offenses are committed within prison during or after the breach of regular leaves. With the start of this struggle, we initially seek the mobilization of struggling parts of society that perceive the injustice and absurdity that are being committed against us. Furthermore, the massification of this struggle in all the country's prisons. That's why we have decided to create a struggle coordination that express the views of prisoners from many prisons who decide to participate in our struggle. Solidarity actions such as demos, interventions, banners, etc. have begun in many cities. New additions to the 187-187A law on terrorism. On 31st May of 2017, the Bill of the Ministry of Justice entitled Measures for the Treatment of Persons Discharged from Penalty for Mental or Psychological Disorders and Other Provisions was put to public consultation. The text to be consulted is amended by the Article 187 of the Criminal Code with two new paragraphs in 187, Criminal Organization, and three new paragraphs in 107A, Terrorist Organization, the so-called Terrorism Law. The new paragraphs provide for penalties for anyone who publicly in any way causes or stimulates commission of the offenses described in Article 187, and 187a. This is a very widespread wording that may well lead to a criminalization of public discourse. A proposal we have already seen articulated by the political and the mass media system in response to the recent action 25 of May 2017 against the former banker and Prime Minister of the PASOK, New Democracy and Leos Co-Government 2011, Lucas Papademos. Besides, just after this incident and on the occasion of Facebook posts, the Governor of the Bank of Greece and Foreign Finance Minister Yanis Tournaras sent the post he wanted to prosecute to Deputy Minister of Citizen Protection Nikos Toskas, who, in his turn, sent a crime report to the prosecutor in charge for preliminary examination on the 27th of May, 2017. The provisions that Justice Minister Stavros Kodonis now brings to be consulted can be seen as part of a wide effort to suppress the unhappy public discourse within the framework of creating terrorism hysteria mood by the mass media and politicians in Greece and more generally in Europe as well. A clear order for the immediate evacuation of three occupied buildings has been given by the prosecuting authorities. According to information from a court of law sources, the order is about the building located at 119 Zodokupigi Street in Exarchia, a building in Haidari known as Occupation Papuchadiko, but also for the City Plaza Hotel which is occupied by immigrants. As a first reflective answer, People in solidarity and squatters have organized demos and solidarity actions since the early days of the information. A judgment of innocence was announced today by the Fifth Court of First Instance of Athens regarding the 30 anarchists who had been arrested during their political intervention in a meeting of the group We Stay in Europe, Nisidagma Square on the 22nd of June 2015, when the referendum was taking place. The misdemeanors attributed to them 
where disruption of peace, collective and continuous attempt to cause dangerous personal injury, collective distinct damage by fire, and illegal position and use of a flare. None of them saw anyone committing any illegal action or recognize anybody. In the absence of recognitions and of any other incriminating element, but also the absence of deception, in the case of those who had refused to submit to the unconstitutional practice of compulsory fingerprinting, the prosecutor proposed to the acquittal of the accused. In prison for 13 years without any evidence. A non-existent accusation and absent elements are the key points of a case which against all logic sent Iriana BL in prison for 13 years of imprisonment with no restraint and no mitigation. The accusations. Based on last week's decision, Iriana was accused of joining and participating in the conspiracy of sales of fire, as well as of receiving, transporting and concealing weapons. As for the first part of the category, her only link was the relationship with her, was the relationship with her partner who was accused in 2011, according to the article 187A for Constitution, Initiation and Participation in a Terrorist Organization, but was unanimously and irrevocably acquitted at first instance. However, this acquitting decision does not appear to have hindered prosecutors and judges in the case of Iriana. Apart from the relationship to her partner, The girl's accusation is based on a finding of the Counterterrorism Bureau, which invokes its infallibility, as the finding no longer exists. On the basis of the above non-existing elements, and despite her being confident that she will be acquitted, she was unfortunately refuted in the worst way. The judicial adventure and uh, the unjustified decision of the 13-year imprisonment without evidence raises serious questions about the role of justice, how prosecutors and judges make decisions, and how easy it is to end up in jail with summary proceedings from one day to another based on an arbitrary scenario with pretexts on terrorism issues. You're listening to 105 FM. The independent, self-organized radio station of Mytilene at Lesbos Island. It's the melody of rage that unites us. Hello comrades, this is a broadcast of counter-information of the self-organized independent radio station of Mytilene, Lesbos Island, 105 FM. We will inform you about local news from Lesbos and other Aegean islands that occurred during the month of May. We will start with some immigration issues. Firstly, at Hill's concentration camp there was an incident of food poisoning. All meals that were served were exposed to unhealthy conditions and because of that many immigrants had to be hospitalized because of stomach disorders. The same food conditions also apply at Mor- Moria concentration camp in Lesbos. Some local people stole food and clothing stuff that are meant for immigrants in Lesbos. There were riots between cops and immigrants because immigrants demanded to be moved to a place with better living conditions to Karatepe. There were arrests. Some people filed complaints for incidents of genital amputations of young girls for religion beliefs. This happens at hotspots all over Greece. The Greek government announced 2,000 new job openings at detention centers. That's another way for the government to take economic advantage uh, of the immigrants. Refugee migrant deportations to Turkey are still happening. The last incident that took place on May 12th was the deportation from Italy to Turkey of 22 immigrants. There are abduction reports of refugees in order to be deported in Lesbos and other frontiers as well. An eviction occurred by cops against an immigrant housing squad. 12 people were arrested. Accusations are made against of the NGO Mercy Corps, one of the humanitarian crisis partners for sexual and economical exploitation of refugees and immigrants. Because of the mis- mischievous living conditions at concentration camps, many suicide attempts made by refugees and reported. 
are reported. An incident of sexual harassment to girl students occurred to a local high school in Midland. The incident was uh, concealed by the self-proclaimed national socialist headmaster Vasilis Makripoulias. In the past years, he tried to impel other teachers and people to promote Nazi ideologies and perceptions to kids, pressing Nazi parties such as Golden Dawn. There are pictures showing this piece of trash hanging out with the former Minister of Justice, Haralabus Athanasiou, who is now the congressman of the political party New Democracy in Lesbos. His trial is still to happen. For at least two years, a father raped his minor daughter. His trial is also still to happen. He was also accused of domestic violence. Now in Samos, all anesthetic of the hospital. Samos is another island of North Aegean in Greece. They refuse to provide anesthesia interventions that concern pregnancy interruption. On Saturday, 27th of May, an Antifa fest was held at the Central High School of Mytilene by the Anti-Fascist Coordination of Lesbos, which included political book fair, 3-on-3 basketball tournament, free food for all with free contribution and DIY live. The fest was a great success for the local society and many immigrants refugees attended it. And to finish our roundup of bad news, we move along to two very different places. We will first hear from our friends at Dissident Island Radio in the UK, followed by news from Rosas Negras on the ongoing struggle against the criminalization of abortion in El Salvador. You're listening to dissidentisland.org. Because radio doesn't have to be painful. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Dissident Islands Roundup of the last month here in London. Well, this year's May there was somewhat more eventful than previous years over here. Fuck Parade 4 made its way through the streets of central London with several sound systems in tow. Here is an interview of one of the activists involved before the event, as featured on episode 191. Hello, thanks for having us back. Hiya. Yeah. It's good. Pretty much a year ago. Pretty much uh, a year ago. Well, we 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 tried to do this kind of as a regular thing. The way May Day's kind of started to become hijacked by um, kind of strange kind of uh, militarised march uh, of, of of various Trotskyites and all the rest of it, where it should be a kind of you know celebration of normal people, a celebration of working people. It's a working people's holiday. I think I think that's part of what we've always been trying to achieve. You know, nobody else is uh, from our side has organised uh, anything for the May the first thing. So. Uh, yeah, do you know what? It's fallen to us again, unfortunately. <laughs> we're back, you can't get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, we're celebrating, you know, it's, we, however temporary it is, we've, we, we reclaim a bit of space, we, uh, we make something creative, colourful, carnival-like, out of absolutely nothing, out of thin air, you know, as, 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 we, as we all know, we have a, a budget of a sh- shoestring, and, uh, you know, yet we achieve miracles year after year. Yeah, it's a celebration, in it, but also at the same time, there's a serious political uh, point to all this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah, we're uh, massive outnumbered never out guns you know um something what we're trying to do uh, with this is kind of reach out beyond the subculture but beyond the milieu and, and get into the uh you know reach the people and like all the kids on the estate we want them to come out and be part of what this is which is you know the, at the end of the day we're all bored we're all very you know a lot of financial problems at the moment every time you t- turn the tv on or look at in the newspaper there's just more to be upset about and there's less and less to be to be cheerful about you know we want to give people something to look forward to you know people people see it on social media they read about it in the paper they go yes we've got something to do you know we're not going to be just sitting around it playing playstation all night waiting for the next bill to drop through the door you know <laughs> and here is our very own legal expert andy with his analysis of the day Fuck Parade, set off from Waterloo to the West End, visiting uh, lots of prominent landmarks, Covent Garden and Lister Square, and, and eventually ended up in a, a squat in Poland Street with only one arrest, I'm pleased to say, which attracted a fixed penalty notice for disorder. Then, with the election looming on the horizon, anarchists are debating whether they might be able to bring themselves to vote for Labour and Jeremy Corbyn. Here are the thoughts of one activist. 
How do you reconcile these issues, having been someone who has been on our show and advocated voting? Yeah, and someone who's also been involved in a lot of direct action in many different spheres uh, of organising, mm -hmm. climate, trade union staff, Palestine, solidarity, activism, many different aspects. But I guess this time it's very different, I think. I want to sort of maybe try to disentangle two kind of trajectories. One is whether it matters if you vote in this general election, given the political circumstances and conditions with people in power at the moment who are going to be massively empowered if they are to win more seats and if they are to negotiate the terms of Brexit for this country within the EU and on the other side within Labour, a complete anomaly of two old socialist activists at the helm of the party who've just released a really pretty radical manifesto on its own terms you know we haven't seen anything like that I mean it's not radical it's basically coming back to kind of yeah. social democracy that people see as radical because we've had neoliberalism intensely for so long one aspect that is really powerful within that manifesto is at the repeal of the anti-trade union laws mm. because I believe in social movements power from below people organizing themselves and basically getting ourselves into a position where we can overthrow the state and capital and the reproduction of the state and capitalism which we are all engaged in in different ways on a daily basis whether voting is some sort of massive reinforcement of that system and process, I would question that because, frankly, if you even had 5% turnout of the electorate in this country, whoever won would still get into power. For me, it's a sphere, it's a terrain of power, which we are right not to, I would say, engage in in terms of perhaps trying to get into it and be MPs and that kind of thing. I, I don't really advocate that. Mm. But when it comes to voting, it's quite a small act. It's quite a minimal act, I would say. And by not engaging in it, you're not actually destabilising that system in any way. I don't think you're impacting on it at all. You might feel better about it because the whole narrative of voting is sold as this is empowerment, this is your voice. Now, in the context of a Corbyn Labour leadership and what's on the table in terms of creating the legislative conditions for people to have more power and agency. I am for that because at the end of the day, these powers are writing laws that are systematising our disempowerment in ever deeper ways. And so if I see the potential for other forms of legislation, and yes, it is still part of the state, but if that's going to free up much more agency, if that's going to make people better off, if it's going to stop disabled people getting their financial support taken away from them, if it's going to stop workfare, if it's going to stop warfare overseas, if it's going to stop restrictive trade union legislation and unprivatise parts of the NHS and the transport system and bring that back into public control, as well as energy. All the, all the campaigning, all the, all the activism that we engage in at a certain point has a demand of power. Mm. You know, I shut down a power station with friends for a week. We set up an EDF chimney to try and put on the agenda that the government should stop pursuing fossil fuels and gas as a fuel for this country for the next 30 years. That's something that now Jeremy Corbyn's Labour would agree with. Don't forget, you can always find out more by listening to our show twice a month at dissidentisland.org. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hi, friends around the world. We are Rosas Negras and Ananka Feminist radio show from El Salvador. Important things have happened during the last month in the region. A lot of feminist organizations have been fighting for abortions, decriminalization since 1998 when the Salvadorian state repressed women's sexual and reproductive rights with the absolute criminalization of abortion. In support of the Salvadorian women on June 7th of this year, it was carried out a global action to, for the reform of Article 133 of the Penal Code. On this action, participate countries like France, Spain, Basque Country, Germany, Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Argentina, and even women's movement from Kurdistan, to whom we give our full respect, admiration, and thankfulness. We are promoting four causes for the abortions decriminalization. Although for us the right thing will be the total decriminalization for the free shows of our bodies. These causes are 
when the fetus life is inviable, for example in a chronic disease, when the mother's life is at risk in case of rape and pregnancy in minors. Related to this topic, organizations like Amnesty International has supported the campaign La 17, that is looking for pardon of women who are condemned to even 40 years for a miscarriage. Other problem that affects the women's life is obstetric violence. It's common in El Salvador that women are poorly attended during labor and in case when women are accused of abortion, they have been questioned before they are recovered. Frequently, hospitals apply cesarean operations even when they are not pregnant. And sometimes women are insulted or denigrated during labor because they express pain. For all this, we support the reform of the penal code and also a new political reform to promote as a public matter and integral sexual education with a positive perspective, not restrictive, with a by access to anticonceptives, including a birth control politics. We encourage you to spread the situation about our country because we need more awareness about our critical condition around this matter. You've been listening to Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World. You can find this audio on our website a-radio-network.org along with links and descriptions of all the radio projects involved. Feel free to share on your own websites and use this show as you see fit on your own radios. Thank you for listening and see you next month on the 15th for a new edition of Bad News. Bad news. Bad news for the state. Bad news for capital. Bad news for patriarchy. Bad news for all forms of domination. Bad news. Angry voices from around the world. Our monthly info show from anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio projects worldwide. If these news are bad, I don't want to be good.